Well, first of all, for those of y'all that were here last week for Danny's service, I offer an apology. I do not have a yodeling pickle with me today. So in a New Yorker magazine cartoon, a man is at a table speaking to his wife and says to her, if you bring joy and enthusiasm to everything you do, people are going to think you're weird. Your life is your life as you choose to live it. We are each given this gift of our life. We are also each given the gift of being able to determine how it is to be used. We can decide any time. We can change our decisions any time. We can improve them. We can tailor them or do nothing and let others and let life make the decisions for us. Kindness that we're talking about today can be one of life's decisions. Kindness can make life more productive, full of ease, and create a way of less effort. However, it's something that we do not fully nor regularly show to ourselves or to others. Aldous Huxley, in a lecture, once said, people often ask me, what's the most effective technique for changing their life? He said, it's a little embarrassing that after years and years of research and experimentation, all I have to say is the best answer is, just be a little kinder. Where does kindness not improve its environment? Obviously, in our relationship with the earth, the physical environment around us, in business, does kindness enhance our transactions? In organizational meetings, how do kindness and respect facilitate progress there and help us achieve our goals? You know, many of us are on committees or in classes or organizations or boards here at the church and elsewhere. What difference does that make? In health, studies have shown that as few as five acts of kindness per week elevates our well-being in lasting ways. In child rearing, in politics, and absolutely in our relationships with our friends and neighbors. Sogyal Rinpoche in his book, The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying says, imagine you're having difficulties with a loved one such as your mother or father, husband or wife, lover or friend. How helpful and revealing can it be to consider the other person not in his or her role of mother, father, husband, whatever, but simply as another you, another human being with the same feelings as you, the same desire for happiness, the same fear of suffering. Thinking of others as a real person exactly the same as you will open your heart to him or her and give you more insight on how to help or be kind. Now, my first memory of having kindness explained to me, not demonstrated like, you know, somebody holding you or comforting you, but literally explained was when I was probably between five and seven years of age. So this is the late 50s, the early 60s. My mother always got to drive the leftover cars that were not in very good condition. Radio didn't work. Another car wouldn't go in reverse. Sometimes there wasn't a heater. It was in Houston, but we still needed a heater. I remember one car that my mother had. Every morning, it was hard to start. So somebody had to open the hood, take off the top of the air cleaner, get a screwdriver, and stick it down in the carburetor. There was a little valve, a little flap there called a butterfly valve to hold that open so the car would start. And once it warmed up, it was okay. But for the first few blocks, if you didn't keep your foot on the brake and the gas, it would die. And I remember being the youngest, my sisters were going to high school and they would get furious and so embarrassed. Somebody's gonna see me at the corner having to open the hood for you so you can start the car. Now, our neighborhood at the end of our street was a railroad track. And on our side of the railroad track is where the white people lived. And on the other side of the railroad track was the black neighborhoods. And we had to cross over those tracks to go to school. And invariably, when my sisters weren't there screaming about having to do this, it would be a black person that would open the hood and help my mom get the car started. 
I remember my mother explaining this, why, even in the late 50s and early 60s, she would stop to help a black person who was on the side of the road with car trouble. She told me, she says, they are the people who stop and help us. The folks that understand how hard life can be when you don't have the best of everything, they show me kindness, and I want to return it to them. Kindness, although not often thought of this way, is a type of power. To use this power, we must practice many other gifts to exemplify it. Piero Ferrucci, in his book, The Power of Kindness, The Unexpected Benefits of Leading a Compassionate Life, list some of those gifts, honesty, warmth, forgiveness, trust, and mindfulness, among many others. Mindfulness is being in the present now, staying where you are with what's going on. It's not, what am I going to have for lunch? What am I doing after church? What happened yesterday? It's being present now. And if we're present, we can truly see that other person that's in front of us. In our church, the Covenant Groups, Wellspring Class, the Lectio Group on Fridays, and other groups emphasize the act of deep listening. This is making eye contact, only listening and not thinking of what our response is going to be when they're through, not judging nor offering a fix for something we may hear. It's allowing that person to speak with us their deepest thoughts and feelings in a place of safety. To be present with someone like that is a gift, the gift of attention, of being kind, offering kindness to them. Now, this doesn't happen on its own. It takes practice. It takes work, like anything worthwhile. When I first moved to North Carolina from Texas, I lived in Raleigh, and through a series of seemingly unrelated events, I found a Zen priest who was teaching a mindfulness meditation class. As the saying goes, when the student's ready, the teacher will appear. The class discussed the difficulty we were having in maintaining our concentration or staying in the present during meditation times. He told us we needed to develop a new or a healthier, what he called habit energy. We all have habits in our life. When we go to bed, when we get up, how we brush our teeth, do we squeeze the toothpaste from the end or the middle, do we stay? And I'll tell you after church which way you're supposed to do that if you don't want to talk with me. You know, do you stay at the sink with water running, brush your teeth, do you turn the water off, or do you go in another room and do other things? We, those are all habits we do unconsciously. We don't even think about them. Habit energy can create an inertia against change in our lives. Now, mindfulness practice is a powerful tool to overcome poor habit energy and replace it with a healthier one. My teacher would say, this practice is much like placing a toothpick on a train track to try to stop a train. It's not going to accomplish a lot to start with, but when we keep it up, every time we practice mindfulness and change at that habit, it makes a difference. In this case, the gift of being present, to be kind. We nourish that toothpick and eventually it'll become a great tree and can stop a powerful train or stop our poor habit energy. This mindfulness allows us to practice those things I mentioned earlier, honesty, warmth, forgiveness, and so on. Your life is your life as you choose to practice it. Other benefits of practicing kindness, as noted by Ferrucci, can be humility, patience, generosity, respect, service to others, joy. Joy comes to our life, and joy helps our life have meaning, even if it takes effort and becomes frustrating at times pursuing this meaning. I can't speak about the benefits of joy without talking about Mary Beth's mom, Marie. I only knew her for three years before her death, but I learned a lot from her. Her favorite word was joy. She had posters on the wall, signs on the wall, coffee mugs with joy. It was everywhere in her heart as well. Now, joy didn't just go fluttering past her house one day and go, I think this is a nice little log cabin by a lake. I'm going to stay here. 
She had to work for it, and she worked hard, but she never thought of it as work. She was a teacher in a small community in West Virginia for about 30 years. She knew all of her students. She knew their siblings, their parents. When they got married, she knew their spouses, their kids, and some of them she knew long enough to know their grandkids. She followed most of them for as long as she lived. She would send out birthday cards, cards of congratulations on weddings, children being born, for any number of reasons. The lasting effect of this kindness showed up and still shows up wherever we go when we're in West Virginia. I can remember going into the little town that she taught in, which is about four miles from where she lived, and go in and mention to somebody that I was visiting Marie Powell. And they would always have a smile on their face and always a story about what a difference she had made to them. On her 90th birthday, in the little grocery store, there's a bulletin board when you go in. Somebody put a sign up and said, Marie Powell's turning 90. And I want everybody to send a birthday card with a dollar in it so she'll get 90 cards and $90 for her birthday. Well, Mary Beth and I got up there the day before or the day of her birthday, and she had a big basket overflowing with cards. She probably got between 150 and 200 cards and close to $700 just because of what she meant to other people. <laughs> After her funeral, we were at the house, and I remember somebody stopped and was coming up the stairs to the front door, and nobody knew who this woman was. She knocked on the door and said, is this Marie Powell's house? Yes. Well, you don't know me, but Marie did such and such for my family and I, and you don't know the difference that she made. We're going to miss her so much. These acts of kindness spread joy to others and made her life and theirs vibrant. Your life is your life as you choose to live it. Many of us say, I just don't have it in me to do that. I don't possess that amount of generosity or joy or whatever exemplifies kindness to myself or to others. Well, each one of us actually possess whatever it takes to practice that type of life. The Buddhist teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, teaches about what he calls seeds of consciousness. All of us have what he calls a storehouse of consciousness that keeps those seeds inside of it. We, so we each have the seeds of joy and anger living in us. We each have love or hate, patience, impatience, kindness, or the capacity to be unkind. It's what gets watered as to which seeds grow. It is how deeply or how committed we decide to be as to what results we see. Much like the mindfulness practice and the toothpicks that we place on the railroad track that develops into a big tree. When I first started dating Mary Beth, I would tell her about Texas, probably till she was sick of it, but I would tell her about it. One thing I usually tell everyone at one time or another is about the wildflowers that grow there in the spring and how beautiful they are. If you've never seen them, it's hard to imagine how wonderful they are, even if you just see pictures. One Sunday at church, Mary Beth and I were sitting over here where we normally do, and she looked across and saw the dean of the School of Public Health sitting over here. And at that time, the organization that Mary worked for was, Mary Beth worked for as part of the university with the School of Public Health, and Mary Beth said, I want to speak with her after the service. So we met right back up here. Mary Beth was speaking with her, and I started talking with her husband. And lo and behold, where was he from? He was from Texas. And I said, hold on just a minute. I leaned over, interrupted Mary Beth, and said, I hate to interrupt your conversation, but I need to tell you, her husband is from Texas. He didn't know what I was going to say. Mary Beth didn't know. And I looked at him, and I said, tell her about the flowers in Texas. And he just went, oh, they're so beautiful. You will want to cry. I had felt so validated at that moment. <laughs> So the first spring I took her to see my sisters and son and the rest of my family in Texas, I kept telling her how great the flowers were. Well, when we arrived, it was in the midst of the worst drought in close to 100 years. And you can guess how abundant those flowers were. There was absolutely nothing. Well, we went back the next year. And this time it had rained 
pretty steadily all winter. And the spring had been wet as well. These seeds had been dormant in the ground for two years. The flowers were unbelievable. My sister Mary Beth and I drove around the countryside near the farm where my sister lived outside of Houston. We started out on a main highway, two lanes in each direction, a grass median down the middle, broad grass shoulders, and there were flowers out there. Not like they could be, but Mary Beth didn't know the difference. Oh, these are beautiful. I said, well, just wait. And we turned off that highway, went down a small state highway, went down in Texas, what they call a farm to market road. It's like a county road out here. And my sister said, there's a gravel road up here. I have friends that live out there. Let's turn down there. So we turned down this gravel road, went about a quarter of a mile, made a right turn, went over a rise, and oh my gosh, almost as far as you could see, there were flowers out in these fields. All kinds, the blue bonnets, Indian paintbrushes, buttercups, yellow flowers, white flowers. It was unbelievable. So we eventually found a spot for Mary Beth to have the requisite picture. Texas wildflower picture taken. What we do in Texas is take our little kids out and plop them in the flowers on the side of a real busy highway, hope a truck doesn't hit us, and take the picture so we can put it on Facebook. But we'd gone so deep off the highway, we were able to get her pictures and the flowers, sitting on the ground, plopped a cowboy hat on her head, by, in front of a barbed wire fence with a longhorn steer standing behind her. <laughs> we had found nirvana of a flower trip. Now I say all of that to say this, as we choose which seeds in our storehouse of consciousness we water, no matter how long they've been dormant in that ground, that's what is going to bloom in our lives. How committed we are to per pursue kindness and all it entails is what type of life and view of it we will experience. My sister and I were able to show Mary Beth the truth of what I have been telling her. Likewise, what truth are we wanting to seek and how willing are we to pursue it? I'm going to close this morning with a poem. The Laughing Heart by Charles Bukowski. Your life is your life. Don't let it be clubbed into dank submission. Be on the watch. There are ways out. There is a light somewhere. It may not be much light, but it beats the darkness. Be on the watch. The gods will offer you chances. Know them. Take them. You can't beat death, but you can beat death in life sometimes. And the more often you learn to do it, the more light there will be. Your life is your life. Know it while you have it. You are marvelous. The gods wait to delight in you. And so it is. I'd like you to stand as you're able and join us in the final hymn, number 318, We Would Be One.
Would you remain standing? We won't be but a moment. May you be happy. May you be well. May you be safe. May you be peaceful and at ease. Before we extinguish the chalice, let's join together in thanking our fabulous musicians. Please join with me in the chalice extinguishing words. They're in your order of service. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Stand as you're able, join hands, and let us join together in singing Shalom. Mm -hmm. 